Hi, I'm Richie Kotzen, and in this video, I am going to be showing you guitar techniques that I use in my playing and on my records. And I want to start off by making sure that we're in tune together. So the first thing I'll do is I'll play each string, and you can get your guitar and make sure that we're in the same tuning. I'll start off with the high E string. As far as uh, my improvement, basically I've been playing the guitar for a long time now. I started out when I was seven. I started taking lessons officially. I was seven years old. And from the be beginning, you know, when I first started playing, I, I always loved it. You know, it was something I wanted to do. Uh, I loved music, and the guitar was always a great outlet for me. Uh, where I grew up outside of Philadelphia, I was, you know, far enough out of the city where there wasn't much to do, but I was close enough to listen you know, to the radio stations and hear that music they were playing back then. So that was very inspiring. You know, a lot of the R&B and the spinners and that sort of thing influenced me as a guitar player and as a musician. And as far as my style, that just came out of different things I was listening to. You know, I would listen to rock bands like uh, Van Halen and and that sort of thing, but at the same time, you know, I was listening to the Spinners and uh, Stevie Wonder and that sort of thing. So uh, I have those kind of influences that come out in my playing, and then also it leads down to the sort of, uh, you know, jazz uh, influence. I wouldn't consider myself a jazz musician per se, but I have that influence and that sort of rock fusion influence from you know bands like Return to Forever and that sort of thing. Specifically. The guitar is concerned. In the beginning of my guitar journey, I started out just learning like anybody else that took guitar lessons, you know, simple songs, and I learned how to read music and notes. And my teacher would write out assignments where I would have to learn how to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and that sort of thing. And then eventually it turned into him teaching me about theory and chords and how they related to each other and how scales related. And then by that time, I might have been 10 or 11, I started listening to records and listening to things that I liked and I would try and figure them out. And, and that's kind of where the real evolution came, where I would like listen to um, an Al Demiola record and try and learn something. And of course I couldn't play it nearly the way he could play it, but you know, it would, it would develop my ear. Or I'd listen to a Van Halen record and, and try and copy Eddie Van Halen and, and that would, you know, take me to another place. Um, and then eventually, I started playing in bands and playing with other musicians. I always tried to play with guys that were older than me and that knew a little bit more. So by doing that, I was able to learn from them and pick up on the things that they had already learned through their experience. And then I sort of would feed off that and then move on to the next. And, and I was lucky in the sense that I've always been able to get in positions where I'm playing with musicians that have had more experiences than me and been, you know, a little bit ahead, you know, down the line. You know, even if it's, and not always musically, not always like musically superior, but maybe they've played in musical situations that I've never been in and I can learn from that. So there's always something to learn, no matter, you know, who the musician is. You can always pick something up. So it's good to pay attention to that. Okay, here we are in the first section of the video, and this is a pentatonic-based licks. Now, in, in my playing, and especially in the, in the rock style of guitar playing, you've got a lot of things that you'll play that'll be based around a pentatonic scale, I mean, even in jazz and obviously the blues. Um, a lot of the note sequences of things that you play on a theory level will come out of this pentatonic scale. It's basically a five-note scale. And what I want to do is start off 
by showing you the scale in the five different positions. Um, in other words, starting off each note of the scale. And what this will do, it'll, it'll enable you to use the entire neck of the guitar when you solo. Because what happens in a lot of guys when they're, when they're playing, they'll start soloing and they'll get caught up in an area of the neck. And whatever they're playing, you know, how complicated or simple, they can get stuck in that certain section of the neck. But you got to remember, you got all these notes available to use. So the first thing you want to do, and this is true with any scale that you learn, uh, you want to be able to play it in any position. That way, you know, you're, you're able to, to utilize the entire neck. And then eventually what will happen is those positions will become a second nature for you, and you won't be thinking in terms of scales at all. You'll just be thinking in terms of melodies and rhythms, which is ultimately when you're soloing and improvising, how you want to be thinking. You don't want to be thinking about, okay, I'm going to use this scale and then I switch to that scale. That's not the way you should play music. Uh, you want to be thinking in terms of melodies and rhythms and hearing what you're playing in your head and translating it onto the guitar. Before you get to a place to do that, sometimes it takes years, sometimes some guys get it right away, you got to learn the fundamentals. So I'm going to start off with this basic fundamental of the pentatonic scale. So the first position, we'll do it in E because that's a popular guitar key. And we'll start off like this. That's position number one. We'll move on to position number two. position number three, starting from the third note of the scale, which is A. And the next position. Next position. And that's the final position. Now at that point we're back to the beginning, which is what we did in the open string, but I'll show you that anyway so you know what that looks like. You probably know this scale already. It's the, the standard pentatonic box. Now as far as the fingering, you know, you can finger it however you feel comfortable. Um, I'm not one of those guys that thinks it has to be fingered this way because sometimes you come up with your own way of fingering things and you can play things that you normally wouldn't have played. So, you know, you can go one, three, one, three, all the way and play the whole thing with these two fingers, or you can uh, use your fourth finger. You know, logically, it makes sense that you would use your fourth finger on the four fret spreads and use your third finger on the third fret spreads, but that's, I'm going to leave that up to you. All right, now what we're going to do is get into basic uh, approaches for, for using this scale. And, you know, all the stuff I show you is going to be things that are more tied into my style of guitar playing because, you know, I can only really show you what I know. So starting off, I'm going to demonstrate a, pen a pentatonic style approach. Uh, this is something that I use in one of my songs uh, on a song called Scared of You. And... Basically what, I, what I'm doing here is I'm going to use open strings combined with fretted notes. And what happens, it makes for a, a bigger sound. And um, so uh, you basically what I'm going to, I'll just demonstrate a variation of, of this approach and then I'll slow it down and dissect it so you can see exactly what it is that I'm doing. <laughs>
Okay, now the reason I'm showing you that is basically to demonstrate this open string pentatonic technique. And this works really well, obviously, in the key of E because it's a guitar key. Guitars tune naturally to open E and open B here. So basically, uh, what I'll do is I'll kind of slow down and dissect what I'm doing here. The next approach I'm going to show you with the pentatonics is more of a single note line. And this lick is going to go across the strings. We're going to tune down uh, the low string to a D. And this lick is, a, is, a, is, is off of another song of mine actually called I Can Make You Happy. And it's a real straight pentatonic scale lick. What makes it unique is the way the notes are phrased. Uh, they're sort of phrased and grouped in, in fives, uh, in, in five note groupings. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, so I guess basically what I will do is play this fast and then I will show it to you slow so you understand how to do it yourself. Okay, so now what I'll do is I will play this at a slower tempo so you can get an idea of what I'm doing. I want to talk to you a minute about the right hand approach on this particular phrase, the way I'm picking it. It's pretty normal up to that point, but then here, there's a little switch around that I want to demonstrate. Right there. It's two downstrokes. And at the end, I'm not really picking anything at the end. But you, the thing there is to, to catch how the this action because that's the, where the accents coming from here's another pentatonic based lick that I used uh, this is more of a, of a technique that I, that I do that I'll demonstrate and I'll start out with a, a very simple 
explanation of it. And what it is, it involves barring and sliding. So you're sort of barring with your first finger. And for those of you that don't know what that means, that's simply when you play more than one string, you know, on the same fret, like that. So I'm barring, we'll start out in, the, in this position, I'm barring on a 12th fret. And so we're getting the notes B and E right there. And, and what, the, what I'm going to show you is this sort of a... It's like that sort of technique. And I'll, I'll play it at a faster speed so you can get the idea, and then I'll slow it down for you. Okay, so let me slow that down. You can see exactly what I'm doing. Okay, that's the first part of it. On the sliding part of it, What I'm doing here, when I get sometimes in these higher strings, I'm changing the pattern a little bit so it doesn't sound as uh, you know monotonous. Um, and also, you know, you can take this all the way up and down the neck. Um, once you get a feel for this sort of thing, you can maneuver across the neck, which I'll show you as well. But I'll just show you moving up and down the neck. Slow. Continuing on this uh, sort of pentatonic barring technique, sometimes uh, you know there's other variations that you can incorporate, and one of the things I'll do with uh, other fingers, uh, free fingers, like my fourth finger in this example, um, say I'm doing this sort of thing that I showed you, and I'll play it slow so you got an idea what's going on here. And then I'll use my pinky to come up here and play other notes. So once I'm, I'm uh, like that sort of thing. And then I'll hit the open note as well. So I'll start pivoting off of this E string. And then I'll throw in like some other notes, like uh, you know maybe an F sharp. It'll give it like a nine sort of tonality. You just go nuts on that if you want. And uh, so what I'll do, I'll, I'll slow that down so you get the basic idea of, of what it is that I'm doing there. Okay, so now what we're going to do here is continue on with what I just showed you and apply that to to more of this sort of uh, barring, you know, pentatonic technique. And, uh, you know, when I say barring, I'm talking about, you know, this sort of thing. Now, what we'll do, so far we've just been dealing with two strings. And uh, we've been hanging out up here in this neck, uh, in this area on the neck. 
you know. Now obviously you can take that to any two strings. You know, you can move to the third and fourth string. Right? But what I'm going to show you is how to, to go across and incorporate more than two strings. Because you, you don't want to be like, you know, a two-string Johnny here stuck on the two strings. So basically uh, what we're going to do is go back to this original position and instead of just using the, the, the top two strings, we'll incorporate the third string. And I'm going to show you at a more higher speed how, how I utilize that, and then I'll break it down for you the same way I did the other licks. Okay. What I just demonstrated there is a very basic approach as what I'm talking about. It's an introduction to using the third string in conjunction with the other two strings. And I'll, I'll play that slow and break it down for you so you understand what I'm doing. And we're going to pivot off of the A note, which is still part of the E <coughs> minor pentatonic scale. Slow. Alright, I want to show you another, it's, it's a lick and it's kind of an exercise. And what this will do, it'll get you used to the idea of going across the strings with this sort of um, barring, hammering, picking, you know, pentatonic thing that we've been doing here in this part of the video. And uh, I'm going to play this, this exercise for you fast, uh, and then as usual I'll slow it down so you can see what I'm doing. <laughs> Slow, here we go. So now you have all those little pieces uh, showing you, you know, the, the basic essence of the technique and how I approach it. Now what we're going to do is put it into a more realistic type of a situation. Like uh, um, I'm going to show you an actual lick where I, I use all those techniques, but I'm going to go all the way down the neck and use the whole neck and all the positions. You know, earlier we learned the pentatonic positions. So here. This is going to show you how to go all the way across the neck, staying within the pentatonics. So far, 
I've showed you all this pentatonic stuff, um, and I've been trying to stick, you know, with the notes that are in the pentatonic scale, just because that's kind of what we're dealing with here. But in a real musical setting, you, you know, you don't you don't play like that. You don't sit and say, okay, I'm just going to use you know this scale. At least you shouldn't be playing like that. So um, I'm going to show you like a, an example of how I might you know incorporate that in a solo. Uh, with other passing tones and, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to play like a, a lick that utilizes all those techniques and then I'll slow it down and demonstrate it for you so then you'll be able to really see, you know, see it in action. Alright, we're going to start off in this position. So that's like the front of the lick. And then we go into this sort of. And here's the key part where we slide down. And we're doing that sort of. And we're in there doing that sort of grouping. And that's a, a different pentatonic shape. So we're already incorporated two of the pentatonic positions. And then we slide down. So we're utilizing this. Then we're in here. Then we come down. instruments um, that was sort of spawned out of necessity you know like I said before uh, you know where I lived I was I was too far from the city to walk to somebody's house uh, you know to necessarily get you know other music to get into the network so I, I would sort of uh, when I made my recordings on my four track I would have to do everything on my own so I would uh, play the drums and play a little beat <laughs> play a bass part and then overdub a guitar part. piano part or something. Um, but, you know, the, I don't consider myself, uh, you know, a, a master at, at all different instruments. That's not how I see myself. Uh, I, I, I consider myself musically inclined. That's how I would put it. And I think that I excel as a guitar player. That's that's my strong point, and then you know, and also probably under that would be you know singing and and that sort of thing, and then by you know my records like you were asking me, I, I play the drums and play the bass. I've always had a love for the bass guitar, and I, I've always listened to the bass in music. You know, 
and the guys like Bootsy Collins and Stanley Clark and those kind of players, that's the style of, of bass playing that always kind of grabbed me as a young kid, you know. And uh, so when I pick up a bass, I kind of want to emulate those guys, you know. Um, but uh, it just comes, the multi-instrument thing comes out of necessity. A lot of times I'll come up with an idea and it'll be too late at night to call a drummer to come over and play, so I'll jump behind the drums and mic it up. It might take me 15 tries to get, get it the way I want it, whereas a real drummer would come in and do it in one or two takes. But you know, at the end of the day, I get what I want, and uh, you know, that's, it's fun for me to do that. I enjoy doing that. It's creative, and it's not the only way I work, but it's one way that I like to, to make my recordings. This section of the video is going to be focused on arpeggios and I use a lot of arpeggios in my soloing and I have a few different forms that I'd like to share with you. It's a, these are a great way to get around the neck and in and out of complex chord changes when you're basically what you're doing with an arpeggio is you're playing the notes of the chord. So for example if you got a G major chord playing the notes that are in that chord, which would be G, B, and D, and then the high octave, you know, G again. And then you repeat it. Like that. So uh, I'm going to start off showing you a very uh, simple form arpeggio, and we'll get into the complicated stuff later as we go on. So let's start out here with, uh, with G major. We're going to do it here starting off on the, on the 15th fret and our first finger, our second finger rather, we'll play the first note which will be a G. And then we have B and then we have a D and then G again and then back down. So that's a real simple form for a G major arpeggio starting on the low string. Um, while I'm showing you this form, I'll show you the minor variation too because it's, it's, a, it's a one note difference, which would be the, the, this note here, which is a B. Let's go down a half step to B flat. So you got G major, and you have G minor. Very simple way of playing uh, an arpeggio. All right, now that you have seen that sort of fingering for an arpeggio, I'm going to show you another fingering to play the same arpeggio. Now, this is a, a fingering that I use a lot uh, to get around when I'm doing solos. It's the same notes, except it's a different shape. And this shape allows you to, to achieve different results, which you will notice uh, as this section unfolds. So let me show you this particular shape. So we're starting, instead of with our second finger, we're starting with our third finger. And uh, we're starting on the same string, same note. And of course, if you want the minor note. The, uh, the shape becomes a, a little different because you're taking a B down to a B flat. But essentially, it's the same sort of thing. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you later on how valuable this particular shape can be, and you'll recognize it in some of the more complicated licks that I show you later on in the video. I know I showed you the particular shape starting on the sixth string, um, and of course you're going to want to play these arpeggios on other strings, not just limited to starting off on the lowest string of the guitar. But before I show you these other shapes, I also want to make you aware of how easy it is to change these arpeggios around. So for example, 
um, I showed you a, a regular G major shape. But if you didn't want to, if you wanted to add some other tonalities, it's very easy to do that by simply changing certain notes. Instead of going G, B, D, G, if I simply lower that note a half step from a G down to an F sharp, um, you have a, a whole new tonality just by moving one note. I can move this into a more comfortable place, which would be down here in C. Actually, that's, a, that's an exercise I could show you. I'll show you that. We'll use that as an exercise. I just kind of came up with that on the spot. So now this is a very spontaneous video all of a sudden. You have a C major arpeggio. And then we flatten that note. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to play that slow so you can see exactly what's going on there. You can obviously do this in a minor form as well. Right? So there's major and minor with incorporating major 7 and minor 7. Okay, so now I've demonstrated to you major arpeggios, minor arpeggios, major, and, major 7 and minor 7, um, all based upon starting on the low string. Um, and also, before I forget too, there's another, in the other shape, the second shape that I showed you that starts from the low string, this one, and we'll move it down to C major where we were a minute ago. You know, remember that shape I showed you earlier? Well, it's just as easy to make that like a, a major 7. And it's major seven because I'm adding the seventh note of the you know of the scale, which is a B. Well, you know, that sort of thing. You'll I'll explain more of that later. I just want you to understand that basic shape there and how easy it is to make it to a major 7 or a dominant 7 just by moving notes around. And I don't want to get into a theory thing here, but that's basically touching on how these forms can easily, easily be maneuvered and transformed into other tonalities that are very valuable for soloing. I, I want to get us off of this lower part of the neck here. We so, we so far have been focused on arpeggios that are starting on the low E string. Um, to do it, starting off, to play them starting off of the, the next string, the, sh the, the form and the shape doesn't change. See? So it doesn't change. But once you get to the fourth string, it changes because of the way the guitar is tuned. So for example, to play a G major arpeggio, one way of playing it off the fourth string is to start this way. And then to make it minor. You just drop that note down. So you have major and minor. And then uh, once again, you know, you can also do what I showed you earlier by adding other notes, make it major 7, for example, which would be like this, which is actually the same shape as this shape, but because of the way the guitar is tuned, it sounds different because you're playing different notes. So I'll let you mess around with those shapes and you can discover some other arpeggios on your own. Uh, and also, um, you can start off uh, playing from the third string, so you're not only limited to starting from the, the fourth and the fifth and the sixth string, and those shapes change once again. And let's 
keep this consistent, we'll keep it in G major, and I'll show you another shape. That's basically a G major arpeggio. We're not starting on the root though, we're starting on the third string, but we're actually starting off of the fifth degree of the scale, which is D. So we have this sound and that shape. And to make it minor, once again, you simply drop down the third and you have a minor arpeggio. <clears throat> if you would like to play the arpeggio starting from the root, then that's a whole other shape off the third string. And you would have to move up to G on the third string, which is at your 12th fret, and you would play this. And then you have a G major arpeggio starting from the root. I'm going to show you now um, an exercise, basically. And we're going to string together the first arpeggio shape that I showed you starting on the low string. And it's kind of like a little chord progression that we're going to follow, which will be D major, B minor, C major, and G major. So we'll have three major arpeggio shapes and one minor shape. And it'll sound like this. Okay, now I'll slow that down so you can hear what it is that I'm playing. And sometimes it's hard to, uh, to play that real clean, so what you want to do is practice it slow, which sounds like this. And in there, we're getting a hammer on. This is, we got pick, pick, and then that's our hammer on. And then it's two picks again. And a pull off. And then it starts over. And actually, we find a lick in there, don't we? We have this sort of thing go back and forth like that, sort of like a Woody Woodpecker sounding thing. And then once again, you can speed it up. Now also what I want to show you is that that just shows you how to jump around also on the starting off the low string. But I want you to be aware of the fact that you don't always have to do that because you have all these other notes that you can utilize. And for example, uh, you can start off on the D here. I'm showing you how to play this lick, you know, all starting off the sixth string, but these positions don't change when you go to the fifth string. So. I'll show you how to go from D major to B minor without having to make such a large jump, and that would simply be by moving this D major down here. It's the same notes in the same octave, but now when you go to the B minor, you don't have to jump as far. to the G, the high one. So you can maneuver and you know move these around. That's basically a good little exercise for you to practice to get familiar with that sort of playing style. So now I'm going to show you another exercise very much like what we just did, only starting with the other shape that starts from the fourth string. 
We're going to start out with one minor and two major. That being the minor one. Major. Another major one. So we got... And we can do that same sort of thing on, on higher strings as well. Here's a slow one. Okay, here's another exercise for these arpeggios, and uh, it shows you how to take them across the, the neck. And the final shape, the final, the way it ends, it's, it's a new shape that I haven't showed you, but it's still another way to play a G major arpeggio. And I'll show you that shape first. So basically, it's bar, a hammer on, and then you're barring up here. And the hammer is happening on the second string. So now I will show you the complete exercise. <laughs> All right, there I just showed you a uh, major uh, exercise. I mean major as in major third. Um, that takes the arpeggios across the strings. Uh, of course, you can do that in a minor way as well, and I will demonstrate that for you. Okay, so now I'm going to try and show you one more exercise utilizing the other, the secondary shape that I gave you, which was that shape. And that exercise would be like this. Slow. So now I'm going to show you a more advanced sort of exercise uh, technique involving arpeggios and it's kind of like linking them together in a chain. And we're going to go over a chord progression. So you'd have... So E minor to B minor. And then we'll go C major to G major. That'll be the end of it, so it would sound like this. And what that, what I'm doing there is incorporating two techniques. One is sweeping across the strings, and then the other one is hammering on. 
And uh, when you combine them, it kind of sounds like what I just did. <laughs> I'm going to show you another arpeggio based lick on the higher strings. A slow. Okay, here's another arpeggio that's higher up on the neck that I can show you, and it goes like this. <laughs> shows that I've been in a lot of different musical situations. I've been in situations with bands and then also as a solo artist where I'm making my music. Um, I think that uh, the nice thing I can say about being in a band situation when it really is a, a band, a real band, uh, when everyone's contributing, which was the case when I was in all the, I was been in only three bands. But the three bands I've been in, it's, they were, it was that kind of situation where everyone would come in with ideas and we would all contribute. Um, that's a cool thing because the end result, you get something that you would not have ever been able to get on your own. Um, you're getting contributions from all sorts of you know, different angles. Like in one band I was in, Vertu, there were, Karen Briggs was a violinist. And she would come up with all kinds of great ideas that were coming from her perspective which to me was new because I had never been in a band with someone who played the violin. So I didn't, you know, it was coming from a different angle for me. And, and I loved it, it was great. Um, you know, being in a band like Poison, these are guys that, that write, you know, or have written hit songs. You know, they, they know how to craft a great song so that the average person can sit down and, and, and listen to it the first time and want to hear it again. And I, and I learned a lot from being with those guys on that level. Um, and then also uh, the other band that I was a part of, Mr. Big, kind of had a little bit of both. You know, they had the, 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 the element of how to write a song that was a hit, like a, like a To Be With You type of song, which was a big hit for Mr. Big. But then also you got Billy Sheehan, who is an incredible bass player, who adds that aspect, you know, and for a guitar player, you go, oh no, there's someone else here that I gotta, I gotta keep it together because if I don't, I gotta keep up with this guy. So that was a cool interaction, being in a situation like that. So you, you take all those musical situations, and if you're, if you're paying attention, you can take the best out of all of them, and then when you go back and do your own thing, you can apply that to, to your own music. And I think that happens subconsciously. You, know, you don't sit down and say, all right, well, I played in this band with this guy, so I'm going to try and do that. It's like the, the good parts of the influences should come together and help you know, and add something to you creatively. Okay, this section here, I'm going to show more uh, scale-oriented licks. Uh, I'm also going to demonstrate uh, some exercises that will help your legato technique and strengthen your left hand. Okay, so I'm going to slow this down so you have a real clear idea of what I'm doing. So it's... And so what's happening here on this lick is I'm incorporating the slide. 
to actually play the note as well as a hammer on. And once you get it going, once you get it going, you don't pick it at all. You know, it's just strictly depending on your the strength of your of your left hand to hammer on those notes and pull them off and slide in and out of them. Okay, now I'm going to show you how to move that in and out of position. And we're going to stay on the same string for now, just to keep it simple. But we'll take that pattern and, and move up and down the neck. So, and this is also another type of an exercise. One thing I want to explain about that sort of thing that I'm doing, uh, call attention to the fact that I'm sliding in and out of notes. And, the, you know, I'm sounding the note by sliding into it. That's a very important uh, thing that you understand that that's how that note, some of those notes are being sounded. Some of them are hammered on, some of them are pulled off, uh, in, uh, and some of them are sliding. Actually, I want to show you one more exercise, even simpler than what I've showed you already. There's a little thing that you can do to sort of get used to sliding in and out of those notes. And it goes like this. And, and you can practice that over and over and, and, and that will help you get used to that sort of motion. I'm going to show you is a something that demonstrates how I use these legato technique and maneuver within a scale and and actually get from you know one point to another across the neck or and I'm going to make this more of like a sort of a, an exercise that'll be based in, in B minor. <laughs> I'm going to show you basically the same lick, only in a different key. It'll be like based around A major.
Now I'm going to show you a, a technique that we touched on earlier in the pentatonic section, a little bit of barring, only in more of a, a regular diatonic uh, scale type of an approach, and that lick would sound like this. <laughs> Okay, so now what I'm going to show you is a lick that incorporates all the techniques that we talked about in this section, the sliding, the hammering on, and moving across the strings. <laughs> records I kind of lost count but I think it's somewhere around 11 I started making solo records when I was 18 so uh, I had a lot of time to experiment I think that's kind of why they're all so different in some ways that has worked for me and in a lot of ways it has worked against me um, but I think what it is is a documentation of my evolution per se as an artist or as a musician now, on my first record uh, it was strictly about the electric guitar in more of a, a heavy metal approach, but like a, a hyper extended heavy metal, like really complicated, difficult, not ordinary. The average guy playing guitar wouldn't be able to play a lot of that music. That was the idea behind the record that I made, the first record. And there was a couple guys like myself that were making those kinds of records back then. And the idea behind that kind of music was it for it to be heavy and aggressive, um, but, but very sophisticated, so that the average person would not be able to play those songs. That was what we were trying to do. And people like me and Jason Becker or Marty Friedman, um, that was the objective back then. And then after you do a record like that, or one or two, then you move into other things. For me, I kind of went back to wanting to be a singer and write songs, and I tried to do that on my second record. I probably wasn't as, uh, uh, as well versed in, in that area because I didn't devote as much time to it. But then after a while I started getting into that sort of thing and I was more interested in singing than I was in playing the guitar. So by the time I, I made my fourth record, I was more focused on my songs and my lyrics and stuff I wanted to say artistically with my song, not so much with my guitar. And then I would go back and forth, and then the next time I would make an instrumental record, it would be more on a jazz fusion level. And that's the record I made called the Intergalactic Fusion Experience, where I had Jeff Berlin come in and play bass on a few songs, who I've always been a fan of him, and Greg Bissonette, who's an amazing uh, jazz drummer, came in and played drums for me on that record. And that was my like take on like a fusion style, like those bands that I used to like like uh, I said before, like a Return to Forever and Mahavishnu Orchestra, those were my bands, you know, back in the day uh, that I really liked to listen to. And so I tried to like pay tribute to those bands with that record. And then I went back again to the vocal thing. And I've always been into R&B and soul music, probably because of where I was, you know, raised in the area that I'm from. And so I, I would try to, to, to pay homage to that music. And I did Wave of Emotion, which was a a rock record but it had a lot of R&B influence and it was my thing and I think it took me a while to find finally come into a style that's my own as a solo artist and I think I did that on the last record I made which was a record called Slow and on that record I think I really was able to combine all those influences that I have been into like the jazz and the and the and the hard rock and the soul music and you know the blues oriented stuff um, but, you know, at, at the heart of what I do, I, 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 like I said earlier, I consider myself musically inclined. 
you know, I, I think, and, and I excel at, at playing the electric guitar, you know, and I think that that is at the core of everything that I do is that I, I am a guitar player, you know, um, when it, that's, that's like, that's like my vehicle, you know, is, is the guitar. All right, this section in the video, I'm going to show you some combination licks. And what I mean by that are some licks that combine the techniques that I've showed you in the beginning of the video. So that would include um, some of the legato-based things and some of the uh, arpeggio-oriented lines that I showed you. And uh, the first one we're going to do will be based in the key of C sharp minor, very sad key. And the lick goes like this. I want to point out a few things on this particular line that I've showed you, and that is in the beginning, this sort of thing, I happen to use a lot. Here we are sliding, which is what we talked about earlier in the legato uh, scale oriented section. And here we're doing a bit of an arpeggio. Once again, coming up, we're starting off with a C sharp minor style arpeggio. And uh, we're adding a seventh, so it's like a minor seventh arpeggio at this point. So. So you can kind of see why that lick falls into what we're calling the combination licks. That lick that I just played combined a few things. It combined the initial legato oriented thing that I showed you earlier, and then I come down here, and we see that arpeggio shape that I warned you about earlier in the video. And then we go back to the first arpeggio that I showed you. Going from C to G major. Okay, the lick that I just played involves the pentatonic barring technique, and it also involves the arpeggio. And it involves sequencing the arpeggio. So if I played it slowly, something that sounds like that.
Okay, that lick that I just played started off with a legato lick, which I showed you earlier. And I worked my way through B minor, hammering and sliding, which is another technique I showed you. And I slid down into a B minor arpeggio. ended it on a descending arpeggio. Slowly. favorite albums that I have made, um, definitely the new one, Slow. That's at the top of the list. Um, I would have to say, uh, I like the top three. I got only pick three. Um, well, Slow would be number one. And then I really like the record that I did with Greg Bissonette, the Intergalactic Fusion record. I think for a guitar, for the, the style of guitar that I play, like that really uh, puts it out there, you know, as far as like what, what I'm capable of on the guitar. And um, also, I think it's a tie. The third, for the third place would be with the, uh, actually, no, it's, I'm going to break the tie. It's, I think the third record would be Mother Head's Family Reunion. Only because that record, I was so... Uh, into what I was doing then. You know, I really was into what I was doing, and the songs meant a lot to me, and the people I was playing with, you know, Atma and Noor played drums on that record, and he is someone that's always been close to me and very influential as a musician, and so uh, that would probably be number three. All right, in this section, I'm just going to show you a few more guitar licks that I use, uh, some things that I like, uh, stuff that I've used on records, and that sort of thing. That's why it's called Favorite Licks. Um, the first thing I'll show you is sort of a wide interval line that I use this type of thing a lot in my playing, and it goes like this. And the part of that that, that is wide interval is which is basically pentatonic bass, and then it goes into a more scalular type thing. But if you want to get really crazy, you can sometimes go... You know, you add that extra note up top. It's another trick. And I'll play that slow so you can kind of see what I'm doing. play it fast. That was fast, now slow. That's slow. Okay, here's another favorite lead of mine, and basically what this will demonstrate is how I personally string together arpeggios. Uh, as you can hear in that lick, there's some kind of bebop influence with some of the chromatic stuff in there. And I'll play it for you slow.
Okay, so that passage that I just played. Um, that sort of thing. That's kind of a part of, of, a, of a solo piece that's on my record. I have a record called Slow, and there's a song. It's actually not really a song. It's a guitar solo that I did, and it's called The Answer, and I'm doing sort of a, this, that sort of a thing, and, and that is taken from, from that piece of music. Okay, that lick that I just played is another arpeggio style of lick and it's also taken from the same piece of music from the same record. Uh, it's a part of the unaccompanied guitar solo piece called The Answer and I'm taking arpeggios and sort of stringing them together and it's a sequencing type of thing that I'm doing. Okay, that lick is a very typical kind of thing I would do, even though it sounds kind of bizarre. It's based over a B minor chord, and I'm kind of choosing some sort of outside notes to give it a certain tonality, almost diminished sound. I do a lot of things where I bend. I sort of take the same kind of shape and kind of move it around and make sure I'm playing notes that actually work within the chords and it kind of creates a cool effect. So I will play that slow for you so you can see what I'm doing. There's actually one straight arpeggio in there, which would be this sort of G major thing, which has an interesting sound against the B minor. And that's the lick. I'm going to show you a few rhythm-oriented licks that, it, that are from some records that I've done. And the first one is from Motherhead's Family Reunion. <laughs> Okay, this riff that I'm going to show you is from a song off of a record of mine called, uh, the record is called Slow, and the song is called Got It Bad. <laughs> Okay, so that lick um, incorporates a few typical Richie Kotzen rhythm moves. And what I would call typical is this sort of thing, where I'm kind of letting this string ring open. 
I'm doing that with the low string. <laughs> I do that sort of thing a lot, and I do a lot of things where I move the, the bottom of the chord I make sometimes like switch around in sort of different ways where I'll put the third in the bass, okay, so I'm technically playing a D major there, but then because the third's in the bass I can slide it up and make this kind of sort of chord, I don't know what it's called. But. And then the other part that's kind of interesting about this line is where I hold the A string and I'm keeping that constant, you know, but I'm bending the high string. It's kind of a little tricky move right there. You can do all kinds of things there, like... Just gives it a, an interesting tonality, so uh, that's pretty much it. That's that's the, the basic uh, approach for that lick. <laughs> This lick is from a song on my first record called Squeeze Play, and it's based on the odd time signature, and it's also using open strings, kind of an interesting riff. <laughs> is played slow. Here's one more rhythm-oriented lick that's from a song of mine called Socialite. Actually, I'll turn some of the distortion down. very difficult line because you have to play it on guitar and on bass so whoever's playing bass there has to be able to keep up with the guitar lick and what makes it interesting are some of these pull-offs that involve the open strings <laughs> play it fast, that part almost comes off as a gliss, but really what's happening there is that. That's actually what's being played.
three favorite records from other artists would be Stevie Wonder Talking Book, because um, that record I remember as a kid. Uh, my mother had that record, so I, and I always had it on a turntable. I got that on vinyl. So um, Stevie Wonder Talking Book. Um, let's see, what other records did I listen to a lot? Um, there was a Black Sabbath record that I used to play all the time, and I, I, I don't remember the name of it because it was a double album, and when you open it up, there was a woman inside of it in a coffin. I think it was it was called We Sold Our Soul for Rock and Roll. I think that's the record, and it had um, the song in there, it had NIB on there. It must have been like a greatest hit. It was some kind of record. It wasn't like the record that was the original record that they had all the songs. Because the NIB was on there, Sweet Leaf. And uh, they had this song called Changes. I'm going through changes. It's a really cool song on the piano. So that record I used to play all the time. And um, let's see, uh, third record. Oh, I know what record I used to play a lot. It was the Iron Maiden record, Number of the Beast. Yeah, I used to play that record all the time. That was like in my heavy metal stage. But I'm just thinking of records that I played a lot, you know. I, and, Totally different kind of records I just named, but yeah, those are the ones. Okay, what I'd like to do now is show you some uh, some of the licks uh, and melodies from the opening song that I performed in the video. Uh, the reason I want to do this is because I think this shows it really sums up all the techniques that I that I spoke about in the video and it shows how I personally use them in my day-to-day -day playing style. You know, I can sit here all day long and show you licks and, and, and those sort of things, but they're still just licks. Where now what I'm going to do is actually show you things that I've played within songs and, you know, used all the, these techniques. And what happens is all this stuff becomes more subliminal. And the objective is, is to be able to play, like I said earlier, you hear something in your head and you translate it to your hands and it just comes out naturally. Uh, you don't want to be thinking about any of this when you're playing. But here are some licks from the opening song which is called Flashback. <laughs> Okay, so I will play that slow for you. So basically what I'm doing here is using the major seven arpeggios that I showed you earlier. And I'm just following the chord progression. D major seven, G major seven, C major seven. They spell out the chords. And I'm actually hearing that melody, even though it's so fast, it's kind of funny to call it a melody. But I hear that in my head and I play it on the guitar. I can't sing that high, but you can see where I'm going with this. So when you hear those chords and that progression, I hear that melody, and that's what I play. Uh, that's the whole. That's the whole introduction, and that came about by hearing the melody, and because I've learned all those shapes and fingerings. I instinctively, when I hear the melody, know where to put my fingers. And that sometimes can take years to be able to develop that. But like I said earlier, everybody's different. So, you know, the more time you spend with the in instrument and the more time you spend actually listening to what other people are playing, that will enable you to play with people and hear these melodies and be able to play these notes that oftentimes are less typical than just playing a standard scale and playing off of a scale. That's the kind of thing that I try to discourage. Oh, 
Okay, here's another lick from the song. <laughs> Okay, actually, I probably shouldn't call it licks, but a passage. And the reason I'm showing you this one is to see how you can kind of move these. Uh... I can't sing that high, otherwise I would for you. But uh... See, I'm using all those kind of arpeggio shapes and those notes that we talked about, but when you play them as melodies, they don't sound like scales. And instead of becoming licks, they become actual melodic passages that you can remember and sing along with if you can sing that fast. <laughs> So that passage there that I just played, just shows how I'm tying together just totally tying together all these different shapes. And then at the end here is the first time I actually really play a straight scale. And that's more for effect than anything, and it also is for me to get from point A to point B. And it's just an expression there. And then I'm back to playing the normal notes. But there's some licks in there that, uh, that I'll show you because you might be able to use them to kind of break you out of just playing regular scales and that's this one here that I happen to like Okay, that lick that I just played is sort of like what I play at the end of the solo in this song. And it's my reason for showing it to you, is it does combine some of the things we talked about earlier, um, the more scale-oriented things into the arpeggios. And it's more, you know, when it's played, as a stream of conscious, as a complete thought, you don't realize, you know, oh, I'm playing a scale, or oh, it's an arpeggio. But by showing it to you that way, you can see how they all kind of mold together and become just a playing style. So hopefully uh, all the information I gave you in this video will be useful. I was trying to start off uh, each section with very basic concepts and then later show more advanced approaches to those concepts and hopefully you can see how I personally apply all that uh, in listening to the opening song that I performed. And that's it. Uh, probably uh, the next time you see me I will be on stage somewhere performing live. And that's it for now. So thank you very much for 
buying this video and spending the time. I had a great time making it, and I hope to see you out on the road sometime soon. Thank you. All right, so everybody's got their heroes, right? And the only way to get as good as a hero is to practice, practice, practice.